If I can have the choir come back out real quickly, and I want to get the, the tail end of that song, Love, one more time, and we'll go in to prayer. First and foremost, I want to give thanks to God for through him all things, all blessings flow. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here, to be able to minister his word. I'm grateful to Pastor Carlos, who is out of the country, and we lift him in prayer. Uh, for entrusting me with ministry and, and, and being able to deliver God's word. Um, I'm thankful to Inspiration Church, so our members that are here. I'm thankful to each and every one of you guys for entrusting me. Um, so I want to tell you all thank you. If I can get that end of that, that, that song, Love. So we'll be discussing love here today. I'm not gonna sing, y'all. I'm gonna leave this to the pro. I should have died. When I should have died. You love me. When I should have died. When I should have died. You love me. I'll never know why you love me. It's a mystery to me now. I'm glad to see Jesus. The night that I cried. You love me. When I should have died, you love me. I'll never know why you love me. It's a mystery to me now. I'm glad to see Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. We'll go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. We know that this is the day that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we want to thank you for the breath of life, Father God. We want to thank you for your ministry, Father God. We want to thank you for a second chance. We want to thank you for your love, Father God. We want to thank you for a conversation about love this morning, Father God. I, I pray that these words are not mine, but yours, Father God. I pray that I decrease this morning, Father God, so that you may increase, Father God. I pray that our hearts and our minds are open to this conversation about love this morning. In the name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, band. Let's, let's give a round of applause for our amazing choir one more time. They're amazing. Our opening scripture is a familiar one, John 3.16. And if we can all stand in reverence for the uh, reading of the opening scripture. And this is one we're pretty familiar with. I guess you can say it's a safe zone for me since it's my first sermon here. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son... So that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can be seated. And can we have a conversation about love? No, that's, that's like a real question, y'all. That's a real question. Can we have a conversation about love? Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about a long conversation. I'm just talking about a very honest and open conversation about love. And I'm not talking about just the romanticism that we know love to be. I'm talking about taking a peek into the peaks and the valleys of love. Are y'all, we can add that conversation? You see, because love is complex. It is complex because it is paradoxical. It is paradoxical because it can be fascinating and it can be frustrating. It can be joyful and it can be painful. It can caress your heart or it can finesse your heart. You see, love is complex we can be at dinner one day and we can be at war the next day we can be drawing up wedding plans one day and the very next day we can be drawing up divorce papers huh we can be holding hands one day and the very next day here we are standing at each other with boxing hands the very next day you see love is complex 
It's these highs and these lows that we go on, these peaks and these valleys, these ebbs and these flows send us all on this emotional roller coaster because you see love is complex that way. But generally what we share with people is the highs of the love because that's what fascinates us. Generally what we share and we talk about with people is the highs of love because that's what is great. That is the grandeur of love. That is the fascination of love. We share that. This is what we post on Instagram, boot up, duck lips, right? This is what we show on Facebook, hashtag love, hashtag the devil is a liar, hashtag relationship goals. This is what we share. We share these highs about love, but do we really share the lows about love? Because oftentimes if we're not sharing these lows of love, we're not really resolving problems in our relationship. I didn't write that down. That wasn't supposed to be in there. These highs of love. If I can share with you a moment about a high of love with my wife, Jacqueline, and I. So when we first met, it was December, our first date was right around this time. It was on a Valentine's Day. And I knew she was an Italian girl. So I said, well, where would you take an Italian girl on a date? An Italian restaurant quite naturally. And so I did some research on restaurants in the area. I found a restaurant. It was called Pino's on Westheimer. And I just gave them a shameless plug, but they're not up anymore. So I found Pino's restaurant on Westheimer and I even went to the restaurant. And when we first met, I would go to restaurants because I you know, didn't know much about fine dining, so I had to educate myself on it. I didn't want to look like a fool in front of her when I went to these restaurants. So I went to Pino's, introduced myself. Hey, I got a, a Valentine's date I'm going to bring here, like, in a couple of days. And I'm just, just trying to figure this whole thing out. I want to take a look at the menu. I want to see, you know, what I should order, what I should drink, and all of that. So, you know, met the manager, met the wait staff, everybody. <laughs> And so we come to the restaurant, walk in. They go, hey, Mr. Delaney. And Jackie's like, whoa, they know you? I'm like, yeah, girl. <laughs> I've been here before. <laughs> Act like you know. And so here we go. We sit down in this, this restaurant, and they bring out the oil and vinegar, bring out some pepper, shake it up, bring out the bread. Ooh, this bread, good. Guy comes out with a, a wine menu. Now, I know we're in church, but I'm being honest, all right? So they bring out the wine menu. And the guy says, sir, what would you like to drink? Now, I researched the wine. I knew what I wanted. I didn't know much about wine, but I did know what I wanted. Sir, I would like the Cabernet Sauvignon, please. <laughs> I look at Jackie. She's still impressed. She's like, boy, he got it. All right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you're right. You're so right, girl. Then the guy comes, he takes our order, and he asks me, sir, what type of sauce would you like with your pasta? Would you like marinara or Alfredo? Now, let me pause there real quick, because my mom is a very brilliant spaghetti maker, but she never taught me about the ins and outs about spaghetti. So when I ate my mom's delicious spaghetti, the only thing I knew was that the sauce was red. And so when this gentleman decided to ask me what type of sauce would I like, I could naturally say, sir, I would like the red sauce. <laughs> I would like the red sauce. And he asked me again, and I see Jackie chuckle, and I see him chuckle, and I'm like, okay, that was clearly the wrong response. <laughs> sir, now all of everything that I just prepared just went out the window. I'm sweating now, and I'm nervous. She looking at me like, this boy don't know what's going on. I said, sir, which one is the red sauce? Which one is red? Marinara. So my point in illustrating that story to you is to, to show you the highs of love, to show you how poetic and how beautiful and clumsy love is. That was our Instagram moment. That was our Facebook moment. That's what we tell and we share with social media. But you see, love is complex. It has a few sides to it, and while we can deal with the fascination of love, there is also a frustration when it comes to love. 
So if we fast forward 13 years, my wife, Jackie, and I, we try and we try and we try to have a child. There's three child tries in there because we had three miscarriages. If you can imagine the torment, the anguish, the, the angst that we went through and trying and trying to have a kid. Yeah, we went through all of those emotional roller coasters. Now, once we had a kid, can you imagine the complete opposite? There was jubilation. There was joy. There was, there was uh, excitement. And there was so much excitement that we had poured everything that we could into our child. A solid six months into parenting, we had managed to fall out of love with each other and fall completely in love with our son. Hmm. How did this look in the, in the household? Frustration would build. Selfishness would build. We were short with each other. We were nice nasty. You ever heard of nice nasty? You know, you're like, you kind, but it's uncomfortable. Like, how you doing? I really don't care. How you doing? <laughs> right? Right? We have an honest conversation about love, right? Right? And so it was very uncomfortable for us. And now this frustration began to build between us. We began to get real petty about things. We began to get in small little spats about things. And it got to a point, it got to a boil that... I texted all of the deacons in our church. I'm out. I'm done. I am no longer in love with my wife. These highs, these lows of love. Highs and lows of love. I'm no longer in love with my wife. I got a call from Pastor Carlos. Slow down, speed racer. You full of a lot of emotion right now. And we counseled with Pastor Carlos. It took a couple of counseling sessions. And what we soon discovered is that we devalued each other and we inflated the love that we had for Ezra more than it perhaps should have been. And let me circle back this way because, see, Jackie was nurtured by her family, by her mother and her father. And for me, I didn't have a father. So for me to have a son, it was incumbent upon me to make sure that I was there and I was never not there in his life. So my passion and my emotion and all of this thing that I poured into my son was because there was a desire to say, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you, Ezra. I'll be here regardless of anything. Jackie said, listen, my mom showed me love. My dad showed me love. My mom nurtured me. And Ezra, I'm going to give you the same thing. So we entered into this relationship with our son with this unyielding love for him. Hmm. This unyielding love. And it was inflated. And here we were at this crossroads. We were out of sorts. We were out of sync. We were out of love with each other. And we're left to answer the question. Who do you Love. Who do you love? Now, if you were to ask Jackie that question at that moment in time, she would look me square in the eyes and say, Chris, I love Ezra. <laughs> if you would have looked me, asked me that question at the time, I would have looked you square in the eyes and said, Jackie, I love Ezra. We knew we were loving someone that deserved to be loved, but we deserved to be loved too. Now, if I look at Jackie and I say, who do you love? Jackie was looking back at me and wanted me to say, Jackie, I love you. And when I asked Jackie, who do you love? I was looking back at her and wanted her to say, I love you. But neither one of us gave those response because you see this ebb and flow of love is complex. Who do you love? Now, I've shared my story. You should never have a pastor in front of you that doesn't open his Bible. So I'm going to open my Bible, but not to the passage. That's just for show right there. Okay. <laughs> but I got scriptures for you. All right. So I'm going to share a story that parallels that of Jackie and I. And it's the story, story of Sarah and Abraham. Now, many of us are familiar with this story, so I will paraphrase it a bit. Sarah and Abraham are this couple that is faithful to God. 
Abraham is this great man of many great nations. Sarah is faithful to God for a child. Now you must understand this text because at the time, the ability to have a child, the ability to have offspring, the ability to have children represented your legacy. It represented where your family would go. It represented you being able to increase your land. So it was important that they had children. Sarah could not have children. She was dependent on God for a child. God blessed her with the child through a surrogate, through their slave, Hagar. Their first child was Ishmael. Now, Ishmael uh, was their first child. And while Abraham was excited, he likely experienced the same jubilation and joy that I had when I found out that I was having a son. And now, later into life, Sarah laments that God has a sense of humor. And she says this because Sarah then gives birth to her own child, Isaac. Now, I believe that Isaac or Abraham is about 90 years of age by the time they are able to have their own child. <laughs> now, after having Isaac, a son of her own, can you imagine what Sarah does next? She's like, hey, Ishmael and that slave woman you got, that surrogate you got, they got to go. I'm done. I'm done with them. And it, might, it reminded me when in the passage it says that Sarah wanted him to leave because he was mocking. Now, I don't know what mocking means in your, in your vocabulary or vernacular, but I don't believe it means enough to send your child away. But she was so frustrated. She was so petty at the time. She says, I just need him to go because he's mocking. Now, this distressed, this distressed Abraham. The Bible says in Genesis 21, 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Can you fathom trying to have a child? You have a child. You're excited about this child. The child comes into life, and then here you are being told to send this child on his way. Abraham is distressed. Abraham is worried. Abraham is filled with anxiety. Abraham is filled with concern. There is a break here in the relationship. The scripture says in 21, Genesis 21, 12 through 13, God said, do not be distressed about the boy and the slave woman. Listen to whatever your wife tells you, because it is through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. You will make a son the son will be made into a nation because he is your offspring. Can you imagine that Abraham is going to God because he feels like his wife is tripping? Somebody say my wife is tripping. Don't you say that. Don't you say it. Don't you say it. You got to go home with her. He's like, man, my wife is tripping. God, I, look, she's trying to send my son off. I mean, come on. I can't, I can't do this. I, I need him. This is my first son. God tells him, listen to your wife. How many times do you have to have a conversation with the very person you're in an argument with? God tells him, I need you to listen to your wife. Now, in this scripture, we can find that God says, hey, Abraham, you're in distress. But he tells him, I need you to seek wise counsel. Now, Abraham goes to God and I need you, God, to give me some instruction. God gives him instructions and says, listen to your wife. Now, he listens to his wife and his wife says, send this child on. But as he sends this child on, God then connects this to a promise. He said, I will make the slave into a nation and your son Isaac will reckon your offspring. Let me bridge this back a little bit for you. After Abraham is not able to have a child, he's able to have a child through his uh, slave, Ish, uh, slave Hagar. Then God gives him a child, only be told, hey, you need to send that child Ishmael on his way. And now God takes it even a step further. He tells him, I need you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Hold on. Hold on. Now, depending on you for this child, I got him. Now you want me to send him off. I finally able to have a child at 90 so years of age. And now you want me to sacrifice him. Could you imagine the distress that he is going through at this moment? Send my son on. Genesis 22, 2 says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Isaac. To the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering that I will show you. 
If I can repackage this, God is telling him, hey, listen, take this one thing that you love, this one thing that you care about, this one thing that you trust. I need you to give it back to me. Who do you love? Who do you love? Is it your phone? Is it, is it your me time? Is it your, is it your friends? Is it your family? Is it your career? Is it drugs? Who do you love? In my life, God said, Chris, I know who you love. You love your child. I know you love your son. I know you love Ezra. But I have ordered you and Jackie to love each other first. Bring him to me. Now, I'm not going to uh, frighten you here because I wasn't bringing Ezra to Mariah to sacrifice him. Okay. But what that sacrifice looked like for me was I had to decrease my ego. I had to decrease my selfishness and I needed to seek wise counsel. This is where the conversation with Pastor Carlos came in where I had to sit down and have someone else take a look at seeing what I did not see. I need another set of eyes to say, hey, you're loving something as it should be loved, but perhaps your love is out of order. You see... When I met Jackie, I, I used to go out to dinner with her, but now I'm over here and I'm, I'm feeding him. I used to take her out to, for walks, and here I am taking Ezra out for walks. You see, I, I used to stay up all night with her, but now here I am, I'm taking him out to the park. I, I, used to, I used to be here with her all the time, but here all my time is being spent with him. Do you remember when you first got into your job, into your career field? You used to be there on time, but now you're the first person to leave. You remember when you first started your job? You remember? You you're the last person to leave. Now you're the first person to leave. You see, our love is out of order. I didn't see it. But another set of eyes could see that it was out of order. Who do you love? And perhaps when we're asking, being asked, who do you love? It is not the person that we are being questioned about. It is perhaps the priorities. While we think we are oftentimes walking away from the problem, we are actually walking away from God's promise. One more time. While we think we are walking away from the problem, because see, I was tired. I was like, I'm done. Jackie was like, I'm tired. I'm done. We're going to walk away from this thing. I don't need this kind of stress. I don't need this kind of drama. I'm done with it. But God said there is a promise attached to this. I don't need you to go. See, some of us may be in a marriage right now, and we're saying, listen, God, I want out of this marriage. But God says, stay. I got a promise for you. Some of us may be in a career field that we're ready to get out of. But God is saying, stay. I got a promise for you. Some of us may be in a relationship or we may be in our own life saying God I am tired of this situation I am tired of what I'm living through I am tired of this anguish God I am ready to take my life I am ready to go God is saying stay I got a promise for you when Abraham went to sacrifice his child Isaac Scripture says in Genesis 22, 12, he says, do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not do anything to him. Now that I know you fear God, you see your sacrifice is tied to your promise. The moment that Abraham was like, hey, you know what, God, I'm going to give this child to you. And here he is about to sacrifice this child. And as he gets ready to lay a hand on him, God says, no. Do not lay a hand on that child. There are things in our life that we are afraid to sacrifice. We're afraid of letting go. There's things in our life that we're saying, I, I can't let this go. I I've been with this too long. I've had this too long. I can't give this up. But God is saying, let it go. And the moment you are ready to let it go, God will tell you, do not lay a hand on it. Because you see, your sacrifice is tied to a promise. My marriage needed a sacrifice. It needed me to let myself go. It needed me to let my unyielding love for my son go. Where was the promise? I inevitably regained my marriage. I inevitably never lost my son. I kept the promise that I had to myself that my son would not be a fatherless child. Where's the promise? That's the promise. If I can connect these Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. He had to sacrifice his son to God to show God that he wasn't fearful of him. And God seeing how much he loved his son. And this is why he said, I want you to sacrifice him. But the moment he got ready to do it, he said, don't. The promises for Abraham was the reckoning of his offspring. Him bringing his son back. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, this passage illustrates God's love for us. It illustrates his sacrifice for us. It illustrates his promise to us. And in the end, God keeps his son. Now, love is complex, right? And so to deal with this scripture, God so loved the world, I cannot deal with it without saying that there was some distress here. Even though Jesus Christ knew what he was going to do, he knew I'm going to the cross. I know why I'm going to the cross. But guess what? When he was on the cross, he cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Some of us are in a walk right now and we're doing everything that we're supposed to do. God, I'm, I'm, I'm tithing, I'm offering, I'm showing up to church every weekend. I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. I do for others. I look out for others, but I'm still having this struggle. God, why? Come on. We can feel like that sometimes. That's that distress. That's that frustration. But we must realize that in the passage, God so loved the world, he showed his love for us. That he gave his only begotten son, it showed his sacrifice for us. That who shall ever believe in him shall have everlasting life. It showed his promise for us. God is telling us, don't fear the sacrifice, prepare for the promise. If I were to give you a, if I were to give you a framework for this, four D's should come to mind if you are struggling with a distressed heart, a distress, dysfunction, distance, indeed. For me, the distress caused dysfunction in my relationship. That dysfunction allowed me to put distance between my wife and I. But the deed was that God had deeded something better for us. Distress will cause you frustration, but God said, do not be distressed. Dysfunction will have you ready to leave, but God says, I need you to seek wise counsel. Distance will allow you to put distance between yourself and the things that you love. That is why God is saying, I need you to give this up. The deed is that God is saying, I know you don't want to sacrifice it, but I need you to listen to my promise. You see, love is complex this way because my distress had me ready to exit, but God said, I have a promise for you. Before God said, Said, you're, you're, you're showing symptoms of love and, and oftentimes we got to watch this because we are showing symptoms of love but we're not really diagnosed with the attributes of love yeah we hold hands but does that mean we love each other yeah we went out to dinner it was fancy it was nice but do we love each other yeah I talk about you all the time but do we love each other oftentimes we are showing these symptoms of love And we have not been diagnosed with the attributes. If for any of us, if in our marriage, in our life, if our love is in distress, God is saying, come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden. I will take up your yoke. God is saying that perhaps we are out of sync. We're out of sorts with love. And this could be out of sync and out of sorts with love with God. Our love with God because we've struggled and we've, we've seen all of these things that we've done to be faithful. We've seen our grandparents grow up and be faithful. And what did they get in the end? I'm out of love with God. I tithe and I offer every week. But I don't see any benefits from it. I'm out of love with God. I am in distress right now. God is saying this is the moment that I need you to recommit yourself to me. He is telling you that whatever is in between me and you, I need you to give that up. What? Who do you love? Who do you love? God has ordered us to love him first. He has ordered us to love ourselves next. He has ordered us to love our spouses next. And he has ordered us to love our children after that. Who do you love? That question is not questioning who do you love, but where are your priorities? The distressed heart. The distressed heart. This love is not just in distress with romantic relationships and not just with the relationships that we have with God. Sometimes it's with our own children. I'm not talking about the the love I have for Ezra, perhaps it is 
placing our children before God. Saying, I'm not going to give up on them, God. I love them. My mom struggles with love with her son. I can't give up on them, God. I love them. I know he ain't right, but I love them. Our relationships with people, our friends, people that were not supposed to betray us. We have put them above God because we have trusted them. We have been through so much with them that we feel like I can't give them up. But God is saying, I need you to bring that to me. Your priorities are off. Love, this distressed heart that we struggle with. God is telling us to bring that to him. And this morning, if you are struggling with a distressed heart, you're with someone that you feel like you love, and perhaps that love is in distress right now. Perhaps we're saying, God, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. This is the moment to seek wise counsel. This is the moment we come to God and we say, God, I, I need you. If we are struggling with relationship with friends that are in and out or maybe family members that are in and out of our lives and we, we keep going on this emotional roller coaster with them, God is saying, bring them to me. Because there is something that is out of line here. I need you to bring it to me. Love is complex. But the scripture says, love never fails. And so through all things, through all complexities, through all desires, through all ups and downs, peaks and valleys, just know that love is God. God is love. Love never fails. Amen.